Well, generically, wars of necessity are wars where I think the vital interests of the nation are at stake in which there are no viable alternatives to the use of force. Uh, for example, diplomacy doesn't uh, look appealing or attractive or it's been shown to be unsuccessful. Sanctions aren't going to do the trick. And living with a certain situation is deemed to be unacceptable. A war of choice is very different. A war, a war of choice is, usually has two qualities. One is that the interests at stake tend to be less than vital. And secondly, there are, in fact, uh, other policies uh, that are available. Uh, it could be diplomacy, or it could be simply tolerating a situation, or it could be sanctions, or, or what have you. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that war of choices are per se undesirable or wrong or bad, but simply they are just that. They are wars of choice, and they only make sense if you believe that the costs and benefits not only line up so the, the benefits are greater than the cost, but also that the costs and benefits of using military force make more sense than using alternative foreign policies. Well, the most obvious one that many people will recall is Vietnam. Vietnam was not a war of choice the United States had to fight. It, uh, it was clearly not central, I would argue, to the overall balance, say, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And the United States invested a great deal, in, in large part because it, it exaggerated the stakes that were, in fact, uh, there. So that, that's the most obvious contemporary war of choice. More recently, you had wars like Kosovo and Bosnia, where, again, the United States did not have to intervene. Uh, our, the interests at stake were important, arguably. So there was some strategic interest. There were some humanitarian interests more than anything else, but no vital national interests uh, were at stake. So those are the obvious wars of choice. The most obvious war of necessity, uh, other than the one I wrote about, the first Iraq war, I, uh, I would say is the Korean War. Uh, in, in 1950 when the North Koreans went across the, uh, th the 38th parallel, and before that, World War II. Well, two things. One is I didn't think that Saddam Hussein, say in 2001, 2002, 2003, had done anything that particularly new, that was particularly threatening to the United States. Or another way of putting it, I did not think the status quo that the, the Bush administration inherited in, in 2001 was per se unacceptable or, or intolerable. Uh, I thought that Saddam Hussein, to use Colin Powell's phrase at the time, was in, was in something of a box. He had lost control over most of the north of his country. You had U.S. and coalition aircraft flying over the north and over the south. Uh, he was really limited in his sway over uh, his own country. We thought at most he had some biological and some chemical weapons. He had not been able to rebuild his conventional military after he, they, it got decimated in the previous uh, war after he uh, invaded Kuwait. We did not think he had anything in the way of nuclear uh, weapons. We did not think he was in any way associated with, with terrorists. So we simply didn't think he represented a, a vital threat to U.S. interests in the region. Rather, he was quite diminished. Secondly, there was a sanctions regime an extensive sanctions regime that, it, that was in place, and though it had eroded to some extent, and clearly money was reaching Saddam Hussein that should not have been, uh, and the like, that I believe there were options to shore up the sanctions regime, not to make it airtight, not to make it uh, impermeable, but again, I thought we could have improved it so that again, it would have not eliminated the threat, but it would have contained the threat. So essentially, I believe that containment of Saddam Hussein was a, a viable and perfectly adequate option. There weren't a great deal of conversations. Uh, there were only a few that I, that I recall. Looking a little bit at the whole question of uh, sanctions in a fairly desultory way, the, the one move that Colin Powell promoted were, was called smart sanctions. And if you recall at the time, the United States was coming under tremendous criticism in the Arab world, also from the left, in this country and around Europe because the sanctions were alleged to be hurting innocent Iraqis. It wasn't true in my view. Uh, the sanctions had all sorts of humanitarian exceptions and if there was any suffering that was going on in Iraq was because Saddam Hussein was causing the suffering but wanted the sanctions to be blamed for it. It was part of his strategy to undermine international support for the sanctions but Powell's idea was essentially to challenge him at that game. So the whole idea of smart sanctions was to make it possible
for Saddam Hussein to import a far, a far larger range of goods and services that would not have military consequences, to essentially take away from him the argument that sanctions were somehow causing suffering, uh, leading to disease, and so forth on the part of Iraqis. And we thought that if we could do that, that that would have the effect in part of, of rebuilding regional and global support for sanctions. That was probably the principal, principal set of conversations about Saddam Hussein. He's also, and you asked the question about Afghanistan, he is also embarking on what I would call something of a war of choice in Afghanistan. Taking a step back for a second, the Bush administration, after doing very little in Afghanistan initially, post 9-11, uh, its rhetoric got more and more inflated about Afghanistan. So you had the Bush administration talking about bringing democracy to Afghanistan. But the Bush administration never resourced that, that policy. So the Obama administration has come in, and interestingly enough, it's increased the resources. You're seeing more combat troops, more trainers, and it's decreased the rhetoric. It now is no longer talking about democracy, but instead it's talking about building a, a self-sustaining Afghan government. But they're also talking about taking the fight to the Taliban. Essentially, what Mr. Obama is doing is making the United States now a protagonist in Afghanistan's civil war. And the, what they're hoping is that the United States can weaken the Taliban and then provide time and space for the Afghan government to build up its capacities so it can deal with the Taliban and it can deal with uh, al-Qaeda. Uh, I would call, call this something of a war of choice. The United States could have more modest goals in, um, in Afghanistan. It could also have more modest means if it was only going after al-Qaeda. But the Obama administration has um, it's made two interesting foreign policy decisions so far. One is to establish the timelines in Iraq, and the other is the build-up in Afghanistan. Both are significant decisions. The phrase war of choice is a neutral phrase. It's a description. Uh, all I'm trying to do is distinguish it from a war of necessity. But the United States, you can argue whether we have a vital national interest in Afghanistan. We have a vital national interest in seeing that Afghanistan is not used as a terrorist platform, a la 9-11. But I, I don't think we have a vital national interest in the quality of Afghan society. So the United States might then say, well, we're just going to limit ourselves to going after the terrorists uh, when we see them. Uh, we're mainly going to use, well, well, whatever mix of military, and intelligence, and other, other foreign policy tools we'll put together. All I'm trying to say is in Afghanistan, the United States has come up with a, a particular mix of tools, and it's decided it's going to basically take the Taliban on along with the Afghan government in a civil war. That's a war of choice. Now, I'm prepared to say it's a defensible choice, and it's worth trying. I am a little bit skeptical whether it will uh, succeed. And my prediction is that roughly a year, a year and a half from now, the Obama administration is going to have to make some, some additional choices. And if I'm wrong and things are going very well in Afghanistan, one choice will be whether we stick with it or whether we even increase our, our ambitions. For example, should democracy building become more of a goal? A more likely future is where things are not going well in Afghanistan. We've put in extra troops, and the general situation in the country is not improving. And the question then is, what do we do? Do we put in more resources, or do we perhaps dial down our goals? And that could be a, a very intense foreign policy debate roughly in a year. I don't believe that. Uh, I think one or two of the people in the administration had a thing about Iraq. And it was mentioned from time to time. And Paul O'Neill, if you may recall, in his memoir, talked about how Iraq was mentioned early on. And people around the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Rumsfeld, including the Deputy Secretary, Paul Wolfowitz, people around the Vice President, Dick Cheney, did mention Iraq intermittently. But there was no intensity to it, and there was no real opportunity to move with it. It's an interesting historical debate whether this administration would have gradually found a way over time to do what it did vis-a-vis -vis Iraq had it not been for 9-11. It's possible, but it would have taken longer and it would have been far more difficult to galvanize the support within the administration and beyond. But again, coming back to your, your basic point, pre-9-11, uh, Iraq was simply not high up on the, on the radar screen. What I believe motivated George W. Bush had nothing to do with religion in the, 
in the proselytizing sense or anything like that. What it had to do more than anything else, I believe, was that he thought that after 9-11 that the United States needed to make a powerful statement to the world, to, to use another phrase that Richard Nixon made famous in another context, that the United States was not going to be a pitiful, helpless giant. And for George Bush and Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice and others, the, the accomplishment of ousting the Taliban and liberating Afghanistan did not take care of that. It did not send the message that they wanted to. It simply wasn't big enough. Uh, the way I put it in the book is it didn't scratch the itch. And they, they came to the conclusion they needed to do something of greater weight and greater significance, and that was Iraq. And they wanted to take Iraq, which had been a thorn in the side of the United States and other countries for some time, and they believed they could oust Saddam Hussein. They believed they could transform Iraq into a functioning democracy, and they thought by so doing so, they would not only send a powerful message to the world that the United States was not to be trifled with, but that they could then use Iraq as a model that would then go on to lead to political change throughout the Middle East. That essentially this would become a transforming historical uh, event and ultimately development. That's what this was about. I've often thought that Dick Cheney was quite conservative. People forget that because he's such a moderate man in his manner and in the way he, in his bearing and the way he conducts himself. But he's, he's extraordinarily conservative. Now, in the previous Bush administration, when Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense, he was also quite conservative. Uh, and he and I had our differences at that time. Uh, once he saw me walking around the Pentagon going over uh, bombing plans, being briefed on it, and he complained to the uh, National Security Advisor and the President about it. Uh, we had our differences when Israel was struck by Iraqi missiles early, in the early days of the war, and Dick Cheney wanted the United States to essentially give Israel the green light to retaliate, and I argued uh, against it, and I uh, prevailed. But the difference in the previous Bush administration is Dick Cheney was the odd man out. You had Dick, and then you had George Herbert Walker Bush, Brent Scowcroft, Jim Baker. These were all traditional centrists. And Dick Cheney was essentially outnumbered and largely went along. And he actually also agreed with the policy. If you recall, Dick Cheney, even afterwards, publicly defended the decision not, quote unquote, to march on Baghdad when people would criticize it. Dick Cheney in this administration, rather than being the outlier, was very much at the core, along with Don Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, and George Bush. And it was Colin Powell, my boss, who was the outlier. So I, I, I believe that Dick Cheney was in a position where he could put forward his more conservative views, and rather than being isolated, he was then right in the center of decision making. And again, as I said, after 9-11, his boss, the president, wanted to do bold things. So Iraq was, ver the idea of put putting Iraq at the top of the American foreign policy agenda was something that Bush was very open to, because Bush was looking to do something big and bold, and Iraq seemed to present uh, to him and others the best uh, option for so doing. I believe after 9-11, the United States had a window to get more involved in Afghanistan than it did. I advocated publicly, it ended up being a front page story in the New York Times. I advocated at the National Security Council meeting with the President, the Vice President, and others that the United States should do more. I thought there was a, a real moment after the ouster of the Taliban where the United States, if we had put in, not hundreds of thousands of forces, but maybe 25,000 forces, and I believe we could have gotten an equal amount from the Europeans, I mean, as they've ultimately done in Afghanistan, as we see now, where they have 30-odd thousand forces. I, I believe then that 50,000 forces, U.S. and European together, could have made a real difference. We could have filled that vacuum, and, and there might have been a re receptivity then where we could have done some serious nation building in, in Afghanistan. So the deterioration that we're now dealing with never would have come about. I can't prove that, obviously, in retrospect. And even then, arguing in 2001, 2002, I couldn't prove it then. I couldn't guarantee that if people did what I was advocating, it would uh, succeed. But I did predict that if we don't do it, the sort of thing that we now have to deal with would come about, that, that ignoring it or doing the minimum would, uh, would almost certainly lead to an Afghanistan that would essentially begin to look like a failed state again. And that's exactly what we have. I believe for two reasons. One is the father-son relationship. Fathers tend to give their sons some space. Uh, 
Secondly, ex-presidents, there's an unwritten rule that ex-presidents give the, the incumbent a little bit of uh, space. I think in this case there was a third thing, though, and it, it's obvious that there was some awkwardness because the policies of the father and the son were so very different. George Herbert Walker Bush, the 40, 41st president, he represented a traditional, what I would call, realist school of American foreign policy. It was a foreign policy of multilateralism, of diplomacy, of limited uh, ambitions, uh, of working with international institutions. His son represented a very different foreign policy of uh, transformational, ambitious, almost radical foreign policy, unilateralism, a heavy dose, a much heavier dose of reliance on, on a military force, a real suspicion of international arrangements. You saw it with the International Criminal Court. You saw it in the realm of climate change. You saw it with the United Nations. So in some ways, they represented the, the fault line of the American foreign policy debate. The former president, the older president, representing the more traditional realist school, that the principal purpose of American foreign policy essentially ought to be to shape the foreign policy of, of others. And his son, representing the radical or more Wilsonian school, the idealist school with the principal purpose of American foreign policy ought to be to shape the internal nature of others. And this, this debate has been going on for more than 100 years in the United States. And it's just fascinating to me that it, the two sides of the debate are so exemplified by a father and son. And it manifested itself in these two wars with Iraq. This is, uh, these are textbook case studies that define the, the basic fault line of the American foreign policy debate. No. Uh, I wrote an article in the uh, Wall Street Journal the other day essentially arguing that we should not criminalize the policy debate. Uh, I read all the memos that have been released by the uh, various Justice Department officials and what they did in the way that legal reasoning sometimes do, almost like accountants. They were basically saying the following forms of activity are not explicitly illegal or excluded under domestic or international statute. I don't necessarily agree with the reasoning. It was certainly aggressive legal reasoning. But it seems to me it's not the sort of thing that gets into the realm of uh, criminality. It's simply aggressive uh, advocacy. If, if the, what's more, they don't set the policy. They were simply arguing the policy. And then it was up to the president and the cabinet and others to make the decision about what was going to be uh, allowed or not. So I, I think this whole debate about whether to prosecute or criminalize those involved is really misguided. What we ought to have a debate in this country is about the pros and cons of certain types of interrogation techniques. That's a legitimate debate about what the benefits potentially are, and reasonable people seem to disagree on that, and what the costs are. And clearly this costs reputationally to the United States. There's, there's moral issues. And again, there's real basic questions about the efficacy of these techniques, whether they actually do provide usable, valuable uh, information. But I don't see this as a legal issue. I see this as a policy issue. And for the Congress in the United States, I don't think we need years of distraction uh, trying to find scapegoats or, or, or alleged criminal activity. I would think we need to have policy debates, and we need to get on with it, because this country faces an array of uh, challenges that, that, that borders on the, the unprecedented. I also think, as someone who's been in and out of government in my career, it's not a smart or healthy thing to do to criminalize advocacy, uh, that people are going to be making arguments in government. And sometimes it may be quite uh, assertive or aggressive or outside the box. Well, fine. That's why you set up processes to vet these things. That's why you need a, a disciplined, rigorous National Security Council process. I would say Pakistan ought to be near the top of the foreign policy heap. It's probably the most worrisome and difficult foreign policy challenge or national security challenge facing the administration. You've got, I don't know, plus or minus 100 nuclear weapons. You have the headquarters, so to speak, of the, the world's principal terrorist organizations. You've got a government that is unable, unwilling, or both when it comes to controlling its own territory. You've got a government that, to some extent, is not a, a government. It's not in control of it itself. Or to add it all up, you've got a tremendous gap or disparity 
between U.S. interests on one hand, which are enormous, and U.S. Uh, influence on the other hand, which is quite limited. And any time you have a gap between interests and influence, you're, you're obviously in an uncomfortable or dangerous situation. And that's where the U.S. is with uh, Pakistan. It also holds uh, the key to some extent with uh, Afghanistan. So getting the Pakistanis to deal with this growing, what you might call, Talibanization of their society, which is bad for Pakistan's future as well as Afghanistan, is something we can urge but we can't force, and we can't do it for them. So we do the odd predator attack, which to some extent helps, to some extent alienates the uh, society. The real question is whether we can build up relevant Pakistani capabilities, because most of their military capabilities, quite honestly, are irrelevant to the challenge they face. They're based upon some, I think, largely non-existent Indian threat, rather than the real threats the Pakistanis face. And it's also not clear to me they have the will. There are large parts of the Pakistani establishment that don't agree that the Taliban represent an existential threat to their country or their society. So I don't see the United States doing in Pakistan anything like it's doing in Afghanistan. I don't see any broad commitment of ground troops. This is a country of 175 million people. We're not going to do that. But I can imagine a war of necessity arising in the context of Pakistani state failure. I can imagine a president of the United States conceivably ordering special forces or airstrikes to deal with terrorists. Or I can imagine a president of the United States ordering special forces in or, or airstrikes to deal with nuclear materials. So it's not inconceivable to me that sometime during Mr. Obama's presidency, be it four or if he has eight years, we could see something of a discrete, you might call it, war of necessity vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. A Pakistani government that, rather than growing, uh, is facing real economic problems is going to be that much uh, worse off in dealing with its internal political and security challenges. I don't see it. I believe that the Chinese are preoccupied with employment, with the success of their economy. They know they're an underdeveloped country. I don't believe the strategic culture of China is also heavily, uh, I don't believe it's a, an imperialist global uh, challenge. I don't believe the Chinese, for example, are going to attack Taiwan. Uh, because again, what the Chinese know they need are literally decades of stability so they can grow their economy. They still have hundreds of millions of people to move from rural areas into urban areas. They know just how underdeveloped they are. Now, if you're asking me 50 years from now, 75 from year, years from now, could a mature China take a different direction? Yeah, I can, I can see that conceivably. I'm not predicting it, but I can imagine it. And the one thing that worries me about China's political trajectory is, that, uh, is what will motivate its people. Uh, the, I worry that the principal motive in China in down the road, and again, we're talking in decades or longer here, could be nationalism, and that would be unhealthy. And that's the reason that I believe it's important that China gradually open up politically, that um, China can't simply be a culture based on materialism. I don't believe socialism or communism are going to be its motives. So I do believe it needs greater political uh, participation. But if I were a U.S. defense planner, a lot of things would keep me up night, and we, nights, and we've talked about some of them, like Pakistan, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like Iran, like North Korea. China would not be on the top ten of that list. For President Bush uh, the first, uh, the 41st president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, I spent all four years of his presidency on the staff of the National Security Council. Uh, technically, I was a special assistant to the president and senior director for Near East and South Asian Affairs. What that boiled down to is I was uh, his and Brent Scowcroft, who was National Security Advisor, I was his and Brent Scowcroft's principal advisor on the part of the world that included North Africa, uh, the Middle East, the Israeli-Arab situation, uh, the so-called Persian Gulf, and all the way through Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan, through South Asia. So I did that for all four years. For the second President Bush, the 43rd President, George W., I was in the administration only for two and a half years, from January 2001 through June 2003, and there I had two hats. I was the director of the policy planning staff for the Secretary of State, for Colin Powell, and a second hat, I was a roving ambassador for the administration where I was assigned specific missions 
the two most uh, prominent that I was assigned was uh, first after 9-11, I was made the U.S. coordinator for the future of Afghanistan. And then even before that, early on in the administration, I became the U.S. envoy to the Northern Ireland peace process. Well, for outsiders, to be frank, it's rare. For careerists, and I, I am not a careerist, I am not a career foreign service officer or a career military or career intelligence, for careerists, that's, that's the norm. You, you serve, and as administrations come and go, it essentially doesn't uh, matter for the most part. For someone such as myself, who's an outsider, I'm trained as an academic. Uh, I've worked for one Democratic president, for Jimmy Carter at the Pentagon. But I worked for Ronald Reagan and I worked for both Presidents Bush, but I also worked for a Democratic senator years before. For outsiders, I would think I'm more the exception. By and large, outsiders come in as political appointees. They tend to have a uh, political alignment, usually if a Democrat, obviously, or, or Republican. Uh, I'm pretty centrist, I think, by, by most accounts. I'm a registered Republican. Uh, but I, I think I was brought in not because of my political uh, affiliation, but rather simply because people in a position of authority, be it, say, a Brent Scowcroft uh, under Bush 41 or Colin Powell under Bush 43, uh, knew me well and simply wanted me to work with them. I thought it was right then and I thought it was right now. I remember the, the conversations in late February 1991, which was at the, when the battlefield phase of the war was ending. And the president and Brent Strokoff, all of us, Jim Baker, Bob Gates, Dick Cheney, everybody was comfortable with stopping. And the concern was that if we went on towards Baghdad or if we intervened in the various rebellions, the so-called intifadas that sprung up in the south and the north, exactly the kinds of scenarios that we then saw in this more recent Iraq war would happen. And I remember saying to people that, you know, that I feared that more Americans would die in that phase of the war than had died in the entire liberation of Kuwait. And there was simply no, for, there was simply no interest in marching on. We, it wasn't what we, the deal we cut with the Congress. It wasn't the deal we cut with the uh, international community. Militarily, Colin Powell, who was then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, talked about what a nightmare it was going to be on the ground logistically and coordinating with various Iraqi Forces. I remember him standing by the easel, given the briefing in the, uh, in the Oval Office about, about that. Uh, so for all those reasons, George, w., George Herbert Walker Bush wanted to keep things uh, limited, uh, wanted to essentially stop and not have the United States get bogged down in, in that type of, uh, uh, of a scenario. That was the, the idea was to keep it limited, and we thought that we could bank a lot of goodwill and use that to, among other things, go on and perhaps promote a peace process between Israelis and Arabs, which in fact happened, which was the Madrid Peace Conference several months later. The one assumption that was flawed and that was wrong is that we, we thought Saddam Hussein would likely fall. We, we believed that he would be ousted by his own people for having led them into a, a, a failed war. That proved wrong. What I think proved right, though, was the idea that keeping Iraq intact was a smart idea because that way Iraq could continue to balance Iran. And we still believed at that point that, that Iran, led by uh, these radical uh, mullahs and the rest, was a much greater threat to the Middle East. And one of the ironic results of the more recent Iraq war is that Iran is the great strategic victor. Uh, it no longer has to worry about Iraq. Instead, it is Iran that has tremendous influence, not simply in Iraq, but throughout the Middle East, with Hamas, with Hezbollah, and so forth. So we were playing balance of power politics in the first Iraq war. And in the second uh, Iraq war, the Bush administration of George W. did not play balance of power politics. And the result is they, they led to an imbalance of power that favored Iran. It's something I ask myself a lot. And you know, I wrote more memos than I can count, making the case both that we had viable alternatives to going to war but also about if we were going to go to war, how to do it in a smart way. And if we were going to do, and then if we were going to go to war, we had to plan for an aftermath and how to do that in a smart way. And my frustration is that virtually everything I recommended at every phase was ignored or rejected. 
Uh, it's not so much that I wished I had argued harder. I wished I had had more opportunities to argue it out. Uh, I've been in government a lot in my life, and you, you never win them all. You don't expect to. But you really do want your day in court. You want your chance. And what was so frustrating to me about this administration, the second Bush administration, is I, I, I essentially felt that people with my views never got their day in court. That there wasn't a National Security Council process that guaranteed that divergent views would really have their, their chance and that things would be argued out. Now, I have no illusions that even if I had had every chance in the world, that things would have been fundamentally different. Uh, I don't think it would have happened given where people, where the center of this administration was after 9-11. And given the, I thought, fateful decision by the uh, National Security uh, Advisor, by Condoleezza Rice and by the President, to put responsibility for the Iraq aftermath in the hands of the Defense Department. I thought that was a terrible decision. It's a little bit like playing tennis and having someone not just be your opponent, but calling all the lines. And I thought the Pentagon should have oversight of the security dimension of things, but should not have oversight of the overall policy. That ought to have stayed in the White House. And it's interesting, several years later, it was ultimately moved to the White House, where it should have been, uh, where it should have been all, all along. So I have tremendous frustrations with the policy. Obviously, I disagreed with it. I had uh, frustrations with how the intelligence wasn't listened to. Uh, but again, I don't believe, given the political balance or imbalance in this administration, that I would have, I would have prevailed regardless of what opportunities I was, given, I was given to make my case. I've just come back from Iraq. I was there about two weeks ago. My own view is that the various timelines of getting the United States uh, out of cities, say, by this summer, ceasing all combat operations by a year from this summer, and getting all U.S. forces out of Iraq over the next two and a half or so years, I believe that there's no way those timelines can be met and have Iraq not once again really descend into a lot more disorder. I simply do not believe that Iraq, the Iraqi police and military forces will be able and willing to take on those kinds of responsibilities. I don't believe that the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi society has reached a point where it can be a self-sustaining, orderly place without American forces there. So my, my hope and my prediction is that sometime after next January's Iraqi national elections, the new Iraqi prime minister and the President of the United States are going to have to work out a new arrangement where essentially the reductions or drawdowns in U.S. forces will move more slowly. And secondly, we will keep some kind of a residual force in Iraq that, where there will not be a withdrawal. But my view is if we stick slavishly or automatically to these timelines, uh, I don't believe Iraq would be ready for, for the responsibilities that it would inherit if and when we left. Well, not exactly. The surge, which really consisted of several pieces. There was the increase in U.S. combat forces. There was the change in strategy, which is probably even more significant, away from offensive so-called kinetic combat operations, much more into a traditional counterinsurgency strategy of clearing out the enemy and then providing security to the, uh, to the, to the citizenry. There was the diplomatic part of it of buying off a lot of the uh, Sunni uh, tribesmen and fighters who had been uh, directly or indirectly supporting radicalism and terrorism. So all of this uh, came together. And indeed, it was probably the most orderly decision-making process of, the jo of George W. Bush's uh, presidency. And, and it showed where a large outside disciplined force that had adapted its tactics and its strategy, uh, in this case to counterinsurgency, could make a real difference. I thought uh, it was, you know, in retrospect, I think it was a smart thing to uh, do. The problem now is whether we can use the time and space that the surge have created to, to help the Iraqis build up a self-sustaining police and military capability. And the, the jury's out. And I would simply say that uh, probably the best we can hope for with Iraq is a somewhat messy future, not a future that looks like civil war, but it also won't be a shining city on a hill. And my view is that uh, the best way to keep a floor under Iraq's future so it looks okay is probably by keeping a residual American force uh, 
for, for years to, uh, to come or, or even longer. Uh, now, this could become a fateful set of decisions for the Obama administration. It's ironic that Barack Obama ran against Iraq, said it was a terrible war of choice. He is going to probably face some fateful choices with Iraq about whether to continue with his timelines. And then if he does, my fear is that then things will begin to unravel. And then he could face, again, some terrible decisions about whether to recommit uh, U.S. forces into a messy situation. Well, he's doing things that I support. Uh, I believe in diplomacy. I don't believe in talking to, that talking to Iran somehow constitutes a concession or a uh, favor. I think he's right to drop the preconditions. What matters in a negotiation is not so much where you begin, but where you end. Uh, so I think all that is to the good. The problem is that he faces an extraordinarily difficult situation where the Iranians have gotten quite far. They've obviously already produced a large amount of low enriched uranium. Uh, if they were to put it back in their centrifuges and reinforce those centrifuges, they could produce the basic stuff of a nuclear uh, device, and they would have to weaponize it. So my, my hunch is he is uh, offering to change American foreign policy at a time when the Iranians are already pretty far down the path of having produced a uh, uh, the, the raw material for a nuclear weapon. And it's not clear to me that the pace of dipl diplomacy can match the pace of uh, technology. And what's slowing diplomacy down even more is the upcoming Iranian election. But I think he's, he's right to try this because the two alternatives to negotiating a ceiling, an acceptable ceiling on the Iranian program, one that we could conceivably live with, the two alternatives are not attractive. The idea of using military force against Iran is an unbelievably unattractive option because it's not clear what it would accomplish, and it's also clear the Iranians would retaliate in some expensive ways. It's all, it also would drive the price of oil up dramatically, it's something we don't need. And it's not at all attractive to live with an Iranian nuclear capability, given Iran's rhetoric, given its support for terrorism. and given that it would place the Middle East on a hair trigger, and given that other countries in the region could well follow suit. And as bad as the Middle East is right t today, one can imagine a situation that would grow worse if, say, Iran, Israel, and half a dozen Arab countries over the next 25 years had nuclear ca capabilities. So that would be, a, that would be a, a nightmare. So I believe the President's exactly right to try to negotiate uh, our way out of this. I don't think though negotiations can be expected to solve this if by solution you mean come up with an Iran that does not enrich uranium. My own hunch is that we would have to be prepared potentially to allow Iran to have an amount of uranium. We could talk about the amount of uranium, the, the production capacity, uh, but it would depend upon, I believe, the level of inspections. We would have to be able to convince ourselves to a high degree that this was all they had, and what they had was not the sort of stuff that was what, that was so-called weapons grade, but rather it was the sort of stuff that you would need for a, a reactor to produce electricity. Now, I would feel better if Iraq had the means in place to produce electricity, and they don't. So again, you've got to be wildly suspicious, but so far at least they haven't crossed that red line. They've not taken the so-called low enriched uranium up to high enrichment, but if they do, then Barack Obama could face one of the fateful days of his presidency, because either the Israelis might decide that is intolerable, or he himself might, might be pressured to declare it intolerable and then act upon it. It's a good question, and after less than four months, it's a little bit hard to tell. But this is a president who obviously listens carefully to his own counsel. He's got uh, people like Bob Gates at the Secretary, Secretary of Defense, who has, I believe, a lot of uh, influence. He's got a retired general as his national security advisor in the person of, of, of Jim Jones. You've got someone like David Petraeus, uh, the central commander, uh, who obviously has tremendous influence uh, both still over Iraq but also over the conflict in Afghanistan. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen, is probably spending more time in, Af in Pakistan these days than he is in, in, in Washington. Uh, you've got a Secretary of State, uh, Hillary Clinton, who's active, plus you've got any number of sp special envoys. I would think the, uh, the difference with the Bush administration is you actually have more players here, that you don't have necessarily any single person who might, who might have quite the, the weight, say, of a Dick Cheney. 
But what you have is a large number of uh, people, and the real challenge for the administration, I will think, will be coordinating all these people and making trade-offs, because in addition to Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, you, you do have the challenge in Pakistan. You do have the challenge coming because of Iran's nuclear program. And you've got all the issues that arise from everything with dealing with great powers uh, to, to North Korea, to the global economy, to climate change, to swine flu. So it's, a, it's an enormously crowded foreign policy inbox. And determining trade-offs, priorities, sequencing, and so forth is going to be a, a real challenge for the administration. When you look around the world, the, the deteriorating economy could cause massive uh, problems in terms of state failure throughout parts of uh, Africa. I also worry about the absence of economic growth, what it would mean uh, for countries, say, like, like China and its potential uh, stability. And I think also the, the lack of trade, the fact that trade is now contracting around the world rather than growing has, I think, unfortunate not just economic consequences, but but political uh, consequences. The, the only upside I can see on the economic side, funnily enough, is the fact that some of the energy-dependent economies, which are essentially cash crop economies like Iran and Venezuela, to some extent Russia, aren't going to have that luxury of, of, of enormous treasuries. And as a result, in the case of Russia, they may actually have to develop a real economy, which wouldn't be bad news. And in the case of places like Iran or Venezuela, they won't have this, uh, all these extra resources to cause mischief. And indeed, to the contrary, they may have to be more responsible to their own citizens for the delivery of, es of essential services and a standard of living. But by and large, those are the exceptions. And I think the, uh, a struggling world economy uh, will, you'll see the, the growth of friction within and between states because of it, and it's not an immediate crisis, but over time it could be a, a real drag, if you will, on, on, on global stability. Actually, it's the same book, pretty much. Uh, Power to Persuade was the first edition. Then we reissued a second edition, which probably had 10% new material, and we changed the title. So it's, uh, they're essentially a similar book. It grew out of my time out of two things. One was teaching at the Kennedy School of Government, and I couldn't find a book that I felt told students who were thinking of careers in government, but also, can, in, and I'll get to this in a second, but also in the private sector. I couldn't find a book I really liked. And I had a lot of experience myself working in government. And what I wanted to do was come up with, was produce a book that would help people figure out what it is they wanted to accomplish and figure out how to accomplish it. And the model I came up with was a compass that everybody had to think about their north, which was their bosses, their south, their staff, their east, their colleagues, and their west, which were those outside their organization but they still had to interact with, how they had to work off of those four directions of their compass to help them figure out what it was they could accomplish and to help pave the way to, to, to accomplishing it. And that, that was essentially the, the model or the structure and I interviewed a lot of people and looked at a lot of people and essentially said, what, what explains why some intelligent people succeed and others fail? And I wrote it mainly at the time for people going into government, but I've increasingly concluded that it, it makes just as much sense for people who are running a Fortune 500 company because when you look at what the worlds these people now run or operate in, it looks an awful lot like a political world. They're facing all these independent constituencies. They're under the glare of 24-7 uh, media and a constant news cycle. They've got to deal with unions. They've got to deal uh, with competition globally and, and domestically. They've got to deal with environmental groups and citizen groups and state legislatures and Washington, D.C. So if you're the head of, a, say, any of the major financial institutions or you're the head of an automobile company, but pretty much anything else these days, you are operating in an unbelievably crowded, complicated, competitive uh, space. So the age, if it ever existed, when a CEO could live in some kind of splendid isolation and issue commands and have those commands followed faithfully, those days simply don't exist. So again, I look at the life of a CEO or someone who wants to be a CEO, 
and I look at the life of someone who's either a cabinet chief or an assistant secretary in some cabinet department in Washington, and increasingly the kinds of political challenges they face to figure out what their agenda is are more important to get to, to translate an agenda into reality. Their worlds look awfully similar to me. Uh, and that's, that's what I tried to do, is come up with tools that would help people navigate uh, extraordinarily challenging political environments, which increasingly you find yourselves in. To me, loyalty has two dimensions. One is to speak truth to power. So wherever you are, that one of the things you, you owe it to your conscience, you owe it to your career, but you owe it to your boss, is to tell your boss not what he or she wants to hear, but what they need to hear. And you need to be creative, but you also just need to be intellectually honest. And if you disagree, you need to disagree, and here's why. The other half of loyalty up, though, of what you owe your boss, is when your boss decides, uh, makes a decision, and it doesn't necessarily go your way, you've got to live with it. You, you can't undermine it. You can't be disloyal. And you don't want to resign every time you don't uh, have your way. It's something I actually write about in the, the Iraq book, because I had to live with the question of whether to stay or resign when, when decisions didn't go my way. And my view is uh, it, it, either it has to be a very big decision that doesn't go your way, and those are rare, fortunately, in life, or it has to be the accumulation of a large number of medium-sized decisions that don't go your way, and you say, hey, this isn't the right place for me. But otherwise, it seems to me you essentially, part of what you owe your boss loyalty up is a, a willingness to work with them. If you've been hurt out, and even if it goes against you, that uh, you, you don't essentially pick up your marbles and go home. Go home. I mention this because in my experience, most people often do neither. A lot of people are afraid to speak truth to power because they're feared there's going to be retribution or retaliation. And secondly, if they don't get the decision they want, one way or another, they sabotage it. They're not enthusiastic or they don't do all that they could and should. They're not professional about implementing it. I'd also say, while we're on it, there's also loyalty down from north to south, what bosses owe their subordinates. And you, it seems to me you owe them their day in court, a chance to make the arguments. If you go against them, you, uh, you've got to, I think you owe it to them an explanation as to why. And if you do those things, I think you're more likely to get the sort of uh, behavior you want from your, from your, from your staff. Mm -hmm.